Diego and welcome to this News 8 throwback special. I'm Marcella Lee. We made history as the first TV station to hit the airwaves in San Diego in May of 1949. News 8 has been around for more than 70 years. If it happened here, our cameras were there. Tonight we crack into our video vault to share some of our greatest hits with you. Let's start the show and get things rocking with a look at the music legends that have hit the stage in America's finest city. Maybe you were at one of these concerts. See if you can spot yourself in the crowd. Waiting in line outside San Diego Stadium Sunday was an event in itself. Thousands of young people gathered in huge lines, waiting impatiently, and at times the crowds were yelling for the gates to open. <laughs> Find some kind of crazy people. What brings you out here? What's, what's the excitement out here? Party. Music! Party! What do you think, man? Security for the Big Rock concert was tripled, and for good reason. There was an abundance of alcohol, marijuana, and drugs. Police did nothing to stop that kind of activity in the parking lot, but once the gates opened, some arrests were made. In the first two hours of the concert, more than a dozen people had been arrested. And inside the stadium, the crowd was going absolutely crazy over the deafening sounds of the heavy rock. Headlining the concert, Blue Oyster Cult, Pat Travers, UFO, and Cheap Trick. To some people, the streets and sidewalks around the California theater must have resembled Halloween or a scene from the Rocky Horror Picture Show. But for new waivers and punk rock fans alike, it was the highlight of the summer scene because the group Devo was in town. And it was definitely a dress-up affair, dyed hair and asbestos suits optional. made their first personal appearance on New Year's Eve of 1961. Their first single, Surf and Safari, was released in June of 1962. Their first gold album was Surf in USA, issued in August of 1963. The Beach Boys' first certified million-selling single was Good Vibrations. From 1962 through 1967, the Beach Boys remained the hottest U.S. recording group. And 20 years later, their faithful fans still remember. How long will the Beach Boys be continuing this? How long are they going to be playing? As long as we're healthy and, and enjoy what we're doing. And we started singing because we love making music, harmony and stuff. So I don't see any reason to stop as long as we have fans that want to hear us. Most rock and roll groups tire of playing their old material in concert, so they tend to rush through it. But the Stones played recent material as well as their classics with equal fervor. All the while, the twisting, turning, prancing, dancing, 38-year-old Jagger in constant motion. On stage, he's a human gyroscope. It's a real testimonial that the Stones, who first gained popularity in 1964, can still find themselves on top of the charts 17 years later. You'll get some argument if you call the Rolling Stones the greatest rock and roll band of all times, but they are definitely the hottest band around today. And on Wednesday night at San Diego Jack Murphy Stadium, you can find almost 70,000 fans who will testify to that fact. San Diego Stadium is a place where memories are usually created, but on a warm Sunday night in August, something different happened. Simon and Garfunkel had come to town. For their fans, the sounds from record albums worn deep from years of listening were suddenly replaced by the real thing.
What you are seeing is all very modern, so they say, modern to the young people who are here for the first ever modern music festival. Okay, they dress weird. Okay, maybe real weird. But not all of San Diego's young people who enjoy modern music shave or color their hair. You can be part of the new music without I shaving normal. your head. Enjoy it. I know. You can be normal and enjoy it, man. Looks like it will be a sellout by showtime. You don't want to miss this. This is going to be a big concert. All Axel. the way, Axel. Yes, Axel. Sell out the night, baby. And today, people were lined up at the Sports Arena box office hoping to get the last few seats behind the stage. When Guns N' Roses took the stage at the sports arena for their sold-out show last night, it was close to midnight. By the time they finished, it was close to three, but no one seemed to mind. It looked more like the crowd you'd expect to see at a Chargers game. Testimony that the Eagles' music spans generations. This is my daughter, my second daughter, and Susan. <laughs> generation X was ready to rock out with the Woodstock generation. singing along Hotel California. I want more. All right, did you see yourself? Hopefully you weren't the one that was carried off by security after passing out. <laughs> Are you hungry for more throwbacks? Next, we dish up vintage clips of some of San Diego's favorite restaurants, plus incredible moments when megawatt celebrities brought their star power to town. And later, a behind the scenes look at how we uncover some of our best treasures. But first, it's time for some trivia. Which famous musicians have called San Diego home? Here's a hint. One of them was in the concert story you just watched. The answers when we come right back. Wouldn't want to live here in San Diego. We've got great weather, the sun, the surf, and a scene that's great for foodies. It's time now to dig into some of San Diego's iconic restaurants. When Ralph Pescara Sr. opened his carryout taquito shop at this spot 38 years ago, he probably never dreamed it would become the lunchtime mecca it is today. Pescara and a single employee worked through the 40s, and by the mid-50s, El Indio was going strong and had a reputation as one of the best Mexican food shops in town. Since opening, El Indio has expanded its menu to serve the tastes of 700 daily customers. The staff has grown to 41 full-timers, and Ralph's son has joined him to help run what's now a booming business. I think the reason that people come is because the food is fresh. It's prepared daily, uh, every morning. Nothing is uh, purchased that's been frozen and brought in to be rewarmed. Pascara Jr. says the shop receives franchise offers all the time, but that's as far as it goes. El Indio's business is, for the most part, drop-in or phone-in carryouts, though the shop sells tortillas to 75 restaurants in and out of town. And it's not just a popular place for its food. Many El Indio employees have been with the shop 15 to 20 years. The family business is likely to stay in the family. Ralph Jr. has three children, which means El Indio is likely to stay the way it's always been. And that's not bad. On almost every busy corner in San Diego, you can find a place which calls itself a liquor store hyphen deli. What they are really are stores where you can buy cold beer and wine and maybe a submarine sandwich wrapped in plastic paper. That's not a deli, but this place is DZ Aikens in the college area. For dinner, all sorts of Jewish-style specialties. For lunch, an amazing selection of sandwiches that aren't cheap, but are big and delicious. And for breakfast, some items such as fried matzahs and scrambled salami and eggs and balinces you just can't get anywhere else. Whatever you order, you get lots of food, and that's the genuine article. 
Back in May of 1944, a small lunch counter with a dozen or so stools was established at First and Juniper here in San Diego. It was called the Juniper Grill then. The place has undergone three name changes and there's been considerable expansion in the past 37 years. The idea of the Juniper Grill, now Hobnob Hill, has always remained pretty much the same. Good home cooking complemented by the friendliest service possible. Now you can get an argument about whether it's best to go to Hobnob Hill for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, but the unknown eater is really partial to their breakfast. Nothing fancy here in the morning. The eater's poached eggs, sausage patties, and hash browns were about what you would expect, only a touch better somehow. Maybe it is the service, or maybe the coffee, or maybe the cranberry coffee cake which came with the meal. Whatever it was, breakfast, even if you pay $3.95, just seems to taste better and even feel better at Hobnob Hill. You may have to wait a few minutes for a table, but breakfast is still such a pleasant, relaxing experience that it won't bother you a bit. And after you finish, you won't be hungry, but consider buying some of their baked goods for a bit later in the day. A banana nut bread or a cranberry cheese bread is a perfect little reminder of a perfect breakfast. The Old Spaghetti Factory is a rather nondescript building that sits on the far west side of the Gas Lamp District downtown. Built in 1898, it used to be a printing company and nestled among the other factories in the area. You might miss it if you're not looking for it. But the location just adds to the charm of the Spaghetti Factory, and once inside, you'll see what I mean. From wall to wall, the place is packed with what the eater likes to call collectible junk. You'll see everything from brass beds made into tables to barber chairs. And right in the middle of the first floor is an honest-to-goodness streetcar from the early 1900s. But what about the food. All too often in a restaurant like this, the food is a letdown compared to everything else. But I'm happy to say such is not the case here. Their menu consists of about a dozen different kinds of spaghetti dishes. Spaghetti is the only thing they serve here. Each meal comes with a salad, a loaf of hot sourdough bread, beverage, and even a dish of spumoni ice cream for dessert. And the most expensive meal on the menu is only $5.95. The spaghetti factory has built up quite a following over the years, and you can expect about a half hour wait on weeknights, longer on weekends if you show up during the dinner hour. But that's really no problem. Just order a drink and elbow up to the mahogany bar and relax. The meal will be worth the wait. Who's hungry now? I am. And guess what? For $5.95 today, you can still get a delicious old-fashioned milkshake there. And it really is so great that all four of these restaurants are still in business today. Coming up, from A-listers to legendary politicians to royalty, a look back at the stars who graced San Diego. And can you name a celebrity who was born in America's finest city? The answers after the break. We have had plenty of star sightings in San Diego through the years, but this may be the most iconic. Several years ago, longtime photographer Ben Cutshaw uncovered this rare lost footage of Marilyn Monroe, Tony Curtis, and Jack Lemmon just playing on the beach at the Hotel Dell while filming Some Like It Hot in 1958. It was on a reel simply marked Outs. So you can imagine his surprise. It is one of our most popular clips. Here are more famous faces we've captured on camera. The presidency is a the great office, it's the center of action. The 1960s are going to be very changing years, so I think everybody should make the decision whether they want to move forward or whether they want to stand still. Thank you we want to move much. forward. Thank you very much, Senator John Kennedy in your Thank case. You, Thank you very much. Advisor. Members of the Kennedy family have a long time association with the state. It was in California the president received the Democratic nomination, spelled out the ideas of the uh, new frontier. To have the opportunity of coming once more to the city of San Diego, California. During that visit, Dr. King told News Aid's Harold Keene he would never enter politics. I feel that my job is uh, in the civil rights struggle and, and one that should stay above uh, uh, both political parties and not become inextricably bound to either. I fished out of San Diego. I used to go to Ocean Beach and Torrey Pines and fish for croakers and Corvinas and fish for yellowtail, and I never had a chance to fish for albacore and tuna because they were always a little more exclusive. On hand for the third annual Backrack Shoemaker Charity Tennis Classic were celebrities like the hosts, Burt Backrack and Willie Shoemaker, actor-director Cornell Wilde, former Tarzan Ron Ely, and Desi Arnaz Sr. But most of the crowd came to see Farrah Fawcett Majors, who has bolted the popular Charlie's Angels TV series to test the waters of the feature film world. Despite her meteoric rise, she's obviously had time to get in a little tennis. Arnold's appearance at a Fashion Valley bookstore drew standing room only crowds who wanted to meet the man with the muscles. 
the former Mr. Universe and star of the movie Pumping Iron, is used to having people stare. Does it ever make you feel funny that people come out to look at you? No, I don't think it's just looking at me. I think people just want to meet me. I think people want to use me for their inspiration. This was network taping of a Christmas special, starring people like comedian Dom DeLuise, actress Shirley Jones, and the host of it all, singer-comedian Dean Martin. Well, I can't give the plot away. I just want you to watch it, that's all. This is no Brooke Shields look-alike. The million-dollar teenage model is doing a three-week internship at the San Diego Zoo. The first day I got in there, they said, all right, here, <laughs> you know, here's the hose. You have to hose down the, you know, the cages or, you know, here's the food. You've got to cut it up for lunch. And it just, I mean, I was put to work immediately, so that eliminated any any sort of a problem. And people just didn't, you know, they realized that I was an, a student intern and that I was there to help as much as I could. Oh, it's just Tom Seller taking his jacket off. Yes, America's current heartthrob can apparently do more than just send women's hearts a flutter. He's a member of the Honolulu-based Masters Division volleyball team. I just have always played competitive sports. I've played a lot of basketball and a lot of baseball, and uh, it's always been my outlet. While the list of guests at the Old Globe Theater has been impressive over the years, this had to be the ultimate. Queen Elizabeth herself on hand to unveil a statue of William Shakespeare. Here again, Her Majesty was surrounded by local dignitaries who accompanied her to the San Diego Museum of Art. Deputy Mayor Bill Cleeter presented the Queen with a book of photographs and a key to the city. Gregory Peck grew up here, born in La Jolla, but my, how things have changed. And at one point in my life, I quit school for a year and I drove a Union oil truck in San Diego, and I knew every street in San Diego. But now I have a hard time <laughs> finding my way in, into the city and out of the new freeways and the new entrances and exits. It's really a great pleasure for me to come home, to come back to Mesa College, because I, I really feel very much connected to this place and to the people here. Did your mama warn you about working with Warren Beatty? <laughs> Everyone's warning me about working with Warren Beatty. <laughs> Um, yeah, and uh, he's a true professional, very bright and, and terrific guy, and I think it's going to work out well, I hope, between us. Married 28 years, I think that worked out really well. All right, so how do we dust off the old film, tape, and decades of scripts to bring you the very best of San Diego's history? We'll show you next. We have seen a lot of wild weather here in San Diego, including this. Yes, this is snow, and it really happened back on December 13th, 1967. Isn't that crazy? Snow in San Diego, that is just unreal, but it happened right here. So who finds all of these memorable moments on film and videotape? As you can imagine, it takes a lot of time to go through it all. We've got miles and miles of it literally back in our archives. Let's meet the woman behind the work now, archives editor, Barb Nielsen. So this is a script book from 1965. These pages hold key chapters of San Diego's story, each word brought to life with vintage video from the News 8 archives. We have saved every story shot locally for the past 70 years. So we have a treasure trove of film and tape. There's so much incredible history inside KFMB stations, and archives editor Barb Nielsen is the one who literally picks up the pieces of our past. This is from 1964. That is so cool. I didn't realize they were wrapped up so little. Long forgotten footage. It says yacht race. That would be fun to see. Untouched for more than half a century until Barb's discovery. It's like looking in a time capsule. She's made it her personal mission to preserve our past. You know, I found some pretty cool things in there, like Mary Tyler Moore doing a promo for News 8. Mary Tyler Moore works in a newsroom, you're darn right I do, on the Mary Tyler Moore Show on TV 8, first in San Diego. And it's just like that was buried for so many years and nobody knew about it. And it's just, it's incredibly special. Also incredible, Barb, a Poway High and SDSU alum, has worked at News 8 for more than 30 of the station's 70-year history. In 2018, she helped launch News 8's Throwback Thursdays. We were at every major event in San Diego history, so to me it's very important to share it. Her favorite part, the nostalgic comments on our YouTube channel and Facebook page. It's really what I, why I do it. 
I, it makes me feel in, incredible, like to bring people's memories to life, you know? They only have memories, they may not have pictures. People didn't really bring cameras around those days. And that's why Barb often tries to connect the past to the present. Is it fun trying to play detective and figure out where these people are today? Oh, absolutely. I found uh, Mrs. America. She's 93 years old and lives in San Diego. It was really fun talking to her. The Mrs. America contest, that's what it was. And at that time, it was extremely popular. Do you have any favorite stories? I love anything Larry Himmel. Tonight we take you to a place that's not much to look at at the outside, but inside it's the perfect blending of hot dancers and fine fashion. Come on, let's go upstairs to Maxie's. I really love his 1979 special on nightclubs in San Diego because you get to see the fashions and the music. Take us through the process. How do you find the certain stories that we end up featuring? For the oldest stories, we have a card catalog. Say I want to find something on the San Diego Zoo. There's actually a zoo card catalog. Sometimes it's random. I will just grab a tape and I'll look on it and I'll see if there's an interesting title. But many loose rolls of film remain untouched. So we still don't know what lives on these. We do not, and that's what I mean. This is just full of treasures that have not been seen. So San Diego, stay tuned. So cool, and here's what they used to use to process film, a film splicer there on the left, a movie scope in the middle, an old counter on the right. The stuff is so neat. Now though, everything has to be converted to digital, and we would like to thank P. Hicks for helping us with that big job. We also want to give a big shout out to our digital content producer, Jen Lothspeech, who makes sure that our stories get posted to CBS8.com, Facebook, the News 8 app, and our YouTube channel. We have so many ways that you can watch anytime on our digital platforms. And don't forget, we share brand new throwbacks every Thursday Day on News 8 at 10 on the CW. And what would a throwback special be without a look at the pandas that have helped make the San Diego Zoo and our town a little more famous? Thank you so much for watching and stay classy, San Diego. Good night.